Oaxaca became what it is today, a beautiful city with monumental architecture, with beautiful gilded altars, with beautiful oil paintings in the churches and in the homes, all because of Cochinil. Alejandro de Avila, who is an artist, but also an anthropologist, was able to develop an ethnobotanical garden in Oaxaca. It shows off the variety of plants that do grow in the state of Oaxaca. To the sides, as you can see, we have the wild nopales with a lot of thorns. And then at the center, we have the cacti that were domesticated here as the host plants for cochineal. He began to identify the plants which were endangered within the state of Oaxaca. And it inspired me to do a series of tapestries based on these endangered species. Oaxaca is a region in Mesoamerica as a whole with the greatest diversity of materials for textiles, that is fibers and dye stuffs, the greatest diversity of techniques Come and see, Jim. And the most diverse inventory of garments and textile design. So this is a four salvage web, Jim. He has turned the loom around, and now he's working from this side. We have a 3,000-year record of how textiles have changed over time. And that is a unique in-way into understanding human experience through textiles. Con el Dr. Alejandro, estoy... Estoy aprendiendo bastante con él. Él me está enseñando muchas técnicas que ahorita ya no se ya no se trabajan. Siempre dejo una parte de mí en las piezas. Todo el tiempo le dedico todo de mí a las piezas. This is silk that has been raised for almost 500 years by indigenous communities, and this thread they dye using local plants. In addition to that silk that we have from the mountains, we have the feathered thread. Feathers have been very important in textile traditions in Mexico. Since the pre-Columbian times, feathers had a very special place. Only the elites would be authorized to wear feathers on their garments. There was a very active trade in feather garments, and probably because it's very labor intensive and very expensive, but eventually it disappeared. Francisco Toledo is our patron saint. He made it possible for us to propose the garden and to make it come true. And we also owe to him, in a large measure, what you see at the Textile Museum. Francisco Toledo purchased a collection of textiles. This collection had a fantastic ancient piece and one of the very few surviving examples of featherwork, a featherwork textile. There are some textiles in the Amazons, in South America, in the Pacific Islands, in the US even, that use feathers in their textiles, mm -hmm. but no culture uses this feather yarn. Yeah. So we, want, we were really eager and interested in replicating this and bringing it Yeah, that back is to a life. big difference, is it? I mean, to be using it in the structure of the cloth, mm -hmm. along with other things. Mm -hmm. It is only one of the six textiles that exist with that technique from that period. It was research, it was studied to find out how the down was dyed and how it was woven. We tried to replicate the technique and 10 years later, we, we are there. We are producing these beautiful textiles that nobody else has seen in 300 years. This was the very first feather textile that the museum acquired in 2008 after a workshop that we had to teach how we think the process was made. Magnificent. We are not only recovering something that was lost, we are also creating something completely new out of these materials. At the Textile Museum, we don't believe in strict borders. <laughs> and every time we can, we try to cross cultures. 
So for the exhibition Ilar el Viento, Spin the Wind, we invited different artists, not only from Oaxaca, but from other places, and Jim Basler was one of them. I was thinking, I'll probably be the only American in the show, and I said, that's it. I'm gonna weave George Washington, because he has all that gorgeous white hair, and I can do it with feathers. Almost all of the materials that I used came from Oaxaca, except the indigo blue linen. This is from a woman that I met in the market in 1970. It's hand-spun silk. She was spinning right on the street, and I bought as much as I could. I was really sort of worried about how I was going to get some sort of Caucasian George Washington skin color. A dear friend of ours sent us the soundtrack from the musical Hamilton, and I thought, I will make my George black. And it gave me the opportunity to use natural brown cotton that I had picked up in a little weaving village in the Isthmus in 1972. And that really delighted me to think that since 1972, I'd held on to this natural brown cotton and was able to use it. So George came off looking uh, some people, when I told people what I was doing, they said, well, he doesn't look dark enough. And I said, well, that's the color of the natural brown cotton. I'm sorry. James Wedge weaves are fantastic. I love the creativity that he has achieved with these eccentric wefts. And the George Washington piece, for me, is a masterpiece. It synthesizes his last several years of working in that technique, but it's beyond skill. It reflects his deep philosophy of what the United States is about, what American culture is about, and what this current moment in American history is about. The mission of this space is to create a forum of exchange, of exchange of ideas, of designs, of experiences, and to contrast cultures and find similarities, find those links among humans and textiles reflect that. But borders always had the reference of the warp and the weft on the loom. You saw in what Noé was doing a four cell which textile, and that is valued. It is valued symbolically because it is an entire piece, and the borders play a crucial role because they're not cut borders, they're woven borders. They hold together. They have the value of being an entirety, an integrity. It's the way the loom is conceived. And I think it reflects an ideology that goes beyond weaving. It's an ideology of what is proper and what is complete and what is presentable and what is strong and steady and will hold. It will not unravel. Getzo with a capital G is the gathering of indigenous people from the regions of Oaxaca. There's a sizable community of Oaxacanos in, in Los Angeles, and uh, happily, they want to keep these traditions alive even from this distance. Gurley and I met at UCLA, and we married in 1965. In 1967, we drove to Mexico City in order to see the new Anthropological Museum, which had just opened up. We looked at the map of Mexico, and there was the city of Oaxaca, which I mispronounced. And we said, I think that's supposed to be really good with folk art. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Mexico City, and I thought, oh, it's only three inches on the map. We can do it. It's a 12-hour trip. That was the beginning of a life-changing experience 
that we will never forget. And it has informed and influenced and impressed upon our life and our work ever since. As we drove, we went through about two or three different zones of indigenous people. Keep in mind that Oaxaca to this day has 14 different indigenous groups living within the borders, and each one of those is expressed in the weavings that the women wear. <laughs> Drive up the coast and you're approaching the state of Guerrero, and there's the Amuzco, which I am wearing today. And my huipil is one of the most complicated weavings that you will find. And this is from Chislahuaca, a town right inside the border of Guerrero. I was really trying to concentrate on what it was I was going to do for my master's degree. And it was from Oaxaca that I got the idea to do my project on natural dyes. I went out to the weaving village, Teotihuacan de Valle, and it was amazing to me to see the sources that allowed them to have this wide range of color. I had my exhibit, and almost half of the show represented influences from the Oaxaca trip. In the late 1960s, we received an offer to continue a school in Oaxaca for teenage girls from the States. And it took about five minutes of discussion from Jim and me to come up with a resounding yes. <laughs> and we packed up our children and our two dogs and whatever we could fit in our Volkswagen bus and drove 3,000 miles to Oaxaca. It was the adventure that we were after. The emphasis was to introduce another culture to these young ladies. And that meant through song, through dance, through language, and of course, through going out to the villages to meet the people. I first visited Oaxaca when I was 15 years old. I lived with Vera Lee and Jim. They were my art teachers my life teachers. And as Verily says, you know, my adopted parents, the Oaxacania people invited me into their homes, into their lives, to understand their art, their music, their dance, and it changed my life. My complete worldview, Oaxaca did. Our status was always tourists. So every six months, we had to leave Mexico. And so on all of these trips that we took, we would fill the car with folk art. There were not too many people who were willing to bring folk art back from southern Mexico. This is a puppet. You can see that mechanism, which is just kind of amazing. It's a very soft wood, and the man talks a lot. One time, I had taken along with me a Time magazine, which had a two-page spread in the middle of it, and its caption was, Man Has a Need for Color. And on it was a wooden animal. And we asked in the craft shop, who did this? And they directed us out to a little village, Arasola, to Manuel Jimenez. He was indeed an exceptional folk artist. This is really an amazing piece. He didn't often do muertos. He did a lot of angels. He was a very, very religious man. So we were lucky to get this piece. It was also a time that mid-century modern was very, very important. The sleek and the rather sterile kind of furniture and the contrast of folk art was quite amazing. Think of Charles and Ray Eames' environment. It was made lively by the folk art that they had collected throughout the world. 
Coming out of UCLA, art department, where things were more of a formal quality to them, I was amazed by the potters. I loved the, the crudeness, actually, or the quality of the hand that came from this heavily grouted clay that was dug from rivers in Oaxaca. There were simple forms, beautiful forms, and uh, I do to this day love those forms as well as anything I could create. I picked that up from Oaxaca. And I picked up a kind of honesty of work ethic, you know. I don't know how to put it, but it was a part of their life. It wasn't really about art. It was just about who they were and what they made. And uh, I liked that. Jack Larson invited me to participate in an exhibit in New York City. And I sent Jack a little maquette of what I was planning to do. Jack wrote back and said, no, you've got to work much bigger. People are working big in the United States. And it occurred to me that in living in, in Mexico, my work had taken on the scale of the human body and everything I was doing was to the scale because that's sort of the intimacy that I would relate to when I would go to the village to watch the weavers. And most of my work, I hope, has that kind of echo in it. Of, of it, it really almost looks like it's from another country. Gala Getza is a Zapotec word. And it roughly, loosely, means gift giving, or reciprocity, or sharing. I also gleaned that from Oaxaca in terms of the generosity of spirit, which has to do with art and sharing your ideas with people who ask and need and all that. And it was life in Oaxaca. It was wonderful. I think there's something so healthy about some time in your life getting up and living somewhere else. It brought a great richness to our lives, really. And it still does.